Amen. The, the title of our service today is, um, it's, it, I, I know you're looking at it and wondering what that is. It's, it's sea call. And no, for you ex military, it is not a government agency. Um, sea call simply means chosen, elected children of God. Chosen, elected children of God. So we want to pray. Lord, we pray this morning for your wisdom, for your knowledge to touch each and every one of your saints, your children who are listening from across the world uh, to across from me, Lord. We pray for your wisdom and your understanding and your revelation, only your revelation, the true revelation in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 So, uh, the facts have been discussed over the last few weeks, last four weeks to be exact, to help us establish a basis uh, for the purpose of this Bible. I mean, as a child of God, don't you want to know the purpose of the Bible? Uh, of course, all of us do. We want to know the purpose of this Bible, the purpose of this word. We don't just want to come here every week and get a good word and say, oh, that was a great word. And then you leave here and not have anything to explain. Just say it was good. You don't know what it was about, but it was good. Amen. You want to come here and take some of the purpose of your Bible, the purpose of this scripture with you as a child of God. Uh, God expects that of us. And so we have been going over the facts for the past four weeks to establish the basis for this purpose of the Bible. Um, and what we've established is that God's direction and revelation to his chosen children through his son, Jesus Christ, is revealed through this word of God. And if you just read it and you don't understand it under the unction of the Holy Spirit, you're just gonna think of it as a nice book. But when you read it, under the unction of the Holy Spirit with the Spirit with you, uh, you know it, it's a love letter from God to his children. And when you start to understand that, it becomes more personal. Uh, then when you read it, you understand it clearly. And it's like, oh my goodness, he's speaking to me from 2,000 years ago. He's speaking to me from since the beginning of time. He knew me and he loved me. So we understand that it's God's direction. It's God's direction and his revelation to his chosen children. Through his son, Jesus Christ. You, you think about it, you read from the beginning and uh, from the beginning on through the end, it talks about Jesus. But we didn't know that if we were not reading under the unction of the Holy Spirit. But when you're under the Holy Spirit, which all of us in here are, you start to understand that God was speaking to us about his son since the very beginning. Since Genesis to the end of Revelation, he was talking about us and talking to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Um, so God in understanding that purpose. God doesn't anymore let his people select or let people select and become his children of purpose because you know that you are a child of purpose if you believe in Jesus Christ. And so he doesn't let any people select and become his children of purpose any more than we let our children select us as parents. How many people in here let your child select you as a parent before uh, you have that child. That's not, that's not, they're not capable of doing that. And on, on the other end, uh, we're not capable of selecting our child, saying, I want this child, I want that child. Uh, the, the, the neighbor's child, two houses down, looks like the perfect child for me. I think, honey, we are going to take that child. That's not how it works. And it doesn't work the, that way with the kingdom of God. God knows what he's doing. He wants to have a personal relationship with each and every one of his children. And he wants you to know that he, he planned this for you since the beginning of time. And so it's so important to know that uh, and to know that it would be insane for uh, people to be able to select God. It doesn't work that way. God selects us before we're able to select him. And that's the beautifulness in it. And so it would be insane to think that this creator of all, the one who created everything you sit on, everything, all the ground under you created, the, the heavens and the earth created all things. The one who fathers the children, his children, would only father children based on who may believe instead of who do believe. 
You, you see, see, he's not going to uh, father children and say, well, if my child, if that child decides to believe in me, then he will be my child. No, it doesn't work that way. He's not a God who, who works on what if. He's a God who works on I am. It is. That is the way it's going to be. And so he created us to know him. Not all of us, but he created us to know him. And so you have to know that, that God... Uh, chose those who would believe in him and those who feel that that God chose or that God gives us our own decision it's insane and it's not true and it's not scripturally correct so doesn't it feel good to know that this God who created all things. See, it feels good to know a friend or a family member who has a lot of money. It feels good to know a, a friend or family member who is generous. It feels good to know the, the, the governor. It feels good to know the president. It feels good to know a king from another country. But the creator of all, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the author and the finisher of your faith, the one who, who created the end at the beginning, who knows all things, said, I created you to know me. Hallelujah. There's one thing to have a hookup from another country, or to have a hookup in your own country, or to know somebody down at the tax office, or to know somebody down in, 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 uh, as a judge. But to know the king of kings, yes. the one yes. who created everything, who was at the beginning, who made all things, says, I created you to have a personal relationship with each and every one of you. Isn't that just the most beautiful thing in the world? Not, the, not that he wanted a relationship with you if you may know him or may believe in him, but we've proven with the scripture that he wanted a relationship with you before you were created, before you took a step, before you were in your mother's womb, before you did anything on this earth. He created you to have a personal relationship with him. There's nothing more beautiful than that. So the least you can do in your life is not have all the money or the success, but to learn about the one who wants to have a relationship with you. How many people have had false relationships with, with people who hurt you and led to death and destruction and all those problems in your life? There is nothing, absolutely nothing, like having a relationship with the, 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 the king of kings, the lord of lords, the author and the finisher of the faith, of our faith, the great I am, the, the one who was and is and is to come, the one known as Jesus Christ and the Father and the Holy Spirit. There is absolutely nothing more important than that. And if you feel that there is, you don't know God. Because my God is awesome. He knows all things. He knows every problem that I'm going to go through. He knows how to get me out of it. He knows how to help me financially. He knows how to help me physically. He knows how to help me mentally. He knows how to help me emotionally. Whenever I go through any type of trouble or any type of circumstance or any kind of type of lack of faith, he knows how to get me back on the right path. There's nothing like him. If I, uh, if I by, by mistake, get caught up in an addiction, he can pull me out of it 100% and just yank me out of it and make me not want it anymore. He can help me to desire him, to love him, to honor him, to worship him, to know that there is no other love except his love. He makes me understand that if I don't learn to love him, I'm never going to learn to love anybody else. So, this God, doesn't it feel good to know that this God loves you? Doesn't it feel good to know that he loves you unconditionally? Doesn't it feel good to, to know that, that pop, by popular belief, people used to think that God doesn't love you anymore, or he doesn't love you anymore because of what you've done, or what you're doing, and his love was never based on that. His love is unconditional because he knew what you were going to do before you did it. So that God chose you, not just as one of his children, but as a child of purpose to receive his grace and to receive his mercy 
on the sin that you committed that you did not know you were going to commit, that you did not know you were even a part of before you sinned. That is the agape love of God. That love is not based at all on anything you've done. It's based completely on everything that his son did. And so that love is unconditional. Um, and the evident, evidence and proof that you are God's child, his chosen child, it's not based on your lineage, it ain't based on your bloodline, your heritage, it ain't based on who you know downtown or who you know across the country. It ain't based on any of your hookups. It ain't based on how much money you have. You can't buy his love. You can't uh, search for his love. You can only obtain his love through him. And that love only, the evidence of it is your belief. The fact that you are here saying, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that he died on the cross. I believe that he was buried and re resurrected from the dead by the Father. I believe that he did all of that for my sins. The fact that you believe that is evidence that he chose you to know him. And if God chose you to know him, I want you to write this down. If God chose you to know him, he will prevail, I mean, or he will reveal, reveal himself to you to believe in him. You hear that? If God chose you to know him, he will reveal himself to you to believe in him. And I want you to write this down. I want you to put an asterisk by this. He doesn't lose his children. The only people that would lose God are the people who never had God. What did Jesus say? Jesus said, nobody can take you out of my hand and nobody can take you out of my father's hand because we are the same. That means that there, it is impossible for God to lose one of his children. Some of y'all are wiping the sweat off your head saying, hey man, I'm glad of that because I've wandered off. How many people have wandered off before from God and disappeared from God? How many people got upset at situations that happened? Look, everybody should have their hands up because we've all experienced it. There's always been a time where you've given up on God, where you said, ah, oh, I don't want to do it right now. There's just too much stress, too much turmoil, too many things happening in my life. And look at you, you're back here. Isn't that amazing how he works? You, you think that if, sometimes we look at the levels and we think, man, well, that the, the, the pastor's wife called me or, or the pastor called me. Woo, I'm glad they called me and reached out to me. And it's, if you look more deep, you know that the pastor was led by God. The pastor's wife was led by God. It was not them who called you. It was the spirit that worked through them to connect to you. So it's not based on anything but our belief in God. And um, we want to make sure that everybody learns this correctly. Uh, he will continue to reveal himself to those who believe in him. Uh, and he doesn't lose on his children. His children will know him. Uh, we, we can fail. How many people have failed before? You failed at a business, you failed at some other stuff, your, your finances, how many people have failed at their finances before? Had troubles in relationships, failed at your relationship, failed at, uh, on your household before, made, did some bad, made some bad decisions in your life? But the creator of all who wants to know you, who has a personal relationship with each and every one of us, he does not fail. He can do all things but fail. Even if he failed, it would be successful. Because he's God. Everything he does is successful. So it's not, I mean, sometimes we get to a point where we think it's a race for souls. That's what we're doing. We're racing for souls. We're, we're racing to save people. We're racing to bring people to Christ. Well, God doesn't fail. You do, but he doesn't. Meaning it's not our race. We're just sharing the news. The good news about Jesus Christ. The race that you're talking about was done on the cross. That's done in John 19.30. <laughs> Remember when Jesus was, was down to the cross and had, had, was bleeding and everything else and he had had the, the, thorn on his, the thorns on his head and he looked up at the Father and what did he say? He said, it is finished. Yes. It is done. It is completed. He has done all that needed to be done. Meaning without him completing it, you can talk to a thousand people and act like they know Jesus, but they don't know him unless he completed his process. 
He did the work. He did the work, not us. We are just vessels who share his word with other vessels. So he said, it is finished. It is done. It is accomplished. Sharing this gospel is such an important thing. I, I want y'all to get this picture of, of when you were children. Uh, let's close our eyes real quick. Can we close our eyes? Can we, can we think of this? You remember um, when you found out some good news uh, when you were young and it was about a friend who was stressing over something or going through something in their life and you had the answer, the true answer. Could maybe have been a, a person who, who, who liked them or a person who didn't like them and you found out the truth about it, that what they were thinking wasn't true and you found out about that. I want you to keep your eyes closed and think about that. Think about that, how, how if you found out about it at the end of class, how quickly you're going to run to get to that person because you want to reveal to them that news. You want to get that information to them. You know that you have to go home and maybe eat some dinner or eat something else, but your, your parents say you can go out and you want to race to that person and tell them that information because years ago we didn't have phones like y'all have them now. So can you imagine but being able and getting out your door ready to race to that person's house and tell them that good news. I want you to open your eyes. That's how we should be as Christians. Yeah. Wanting to run and tell people the good news. Not worried about how many people uh, you can save or how many people you can count and talk to uh, about Jesus and, and know that you've done the work. You should be running towards people wanting to reveal to them the good news about Jesus Christ. What is the good news? That he did it all and yeah. you don't have to. <laughs> He died for you. He gave his life for you. It is your sins he died for. And for those people who think it was different, think, oh man, I gotta make myself right with God. You will never be right with God because you're trying to do something that only Jesus did. And so when you get to that recipient of that news to tell the truth, it feels so good to tell that person the truth. That's how good it should be for us to tell other people the truth about Jesus Christ. How many people know that there are false teachers out there? Yeah. How many people there know that there are people who uh, interpret the word their own way instead of the right way? There's only one way to interpret it. That's the right way or the wrong way. But we only focus on the right way. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is who did Jesus do, do this for? When we tell people the good news about Jesus Christ and that he did all the work for salvation, because some of us think we have to work for salvation. It's not a work for salvation. You either have it or you don't have it. It's really that simple. So when we tell people the good news that Jesus did all the work for salvation, and if you, the person asks, well, what do I have to do? And you say, well, if you believe, and you're even asking that question, he did that work already for you. Meaning your interest in wanting to know what to do is evidence that you already know him. Because most people who don't want to know God would not be interested in even you talking to them about Jesus. So the question that, that needs to be answered, because we were talking about this last week. So we were talking about the elected children of God. And what did we name this service? The chosen elected children of God. So the question that needs to be answered is, does Jesus speak of this group and identify them as God's elect? Because last week we identified Paul as speaking of the elect several times over and over again, saying that everybody was predestined. The children are predestined. Those who know God are the elected children of God. But now the, there's always people who ask the question, well, where does it say it in Jesus' language? When, did, when Jesus spoke, when did he talk about that? So we want to answer that today. So the question is, does Jesus speak of this group? Does he identify them in, as the elect? Well, first, let's start at John 10. We want to start at John 10, uh, where Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees who called themselves representing God. 
They called them, if, if you knew anything about the Pharisees, you knew that they uh, honored the law. They stuck to the law, str the strict interpretation of the law. And people, man, the people's faults were not acceptable, man. They had to sacrifice animals. They had to give up all their money and give up all these things. And, and these are all the things that are supposed to be done for serving God. And what it did is it ended up condemning everybody and making everybody feel unworthy versus feeling the glory of God. When we were praising God this morning, everybody was just holding their hands up. It wasn't based on anything you've done or will do. You're just thanking God for the glory of God, for what he has done for us. Well, that's not what they did back then. And so we're going to start with John 10, when Jesus is speaking to these Pharisees. And he's talking to them about their legalistic ways and all the things that they're doing. Um, and you have to understand that these were the representative that these believers had of God. So when they, when you think of God, think about it. If you've been to church for many years, uh, you have a condition of what you think about God. So you know, for me, I thought God was 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 was, was a bunch of um, people who faked it. I, I used to, I'm just talking about from years ago of me learning myself. I thought these people were hypocrites. Who's ever said that word before? When you think of uh, people of God, you think of they're hypocrites. They're talking all this, and they say this and do that, and they, they 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 don't take care of the people. They have all these lavish cars. They have all these lavish houses, but they're getting them from poor people who don't have the money. You, you, you get what I'm saying? That's just how I thought of it. So, this is the believers. These are these believers who they had to worship God. I mean, they had these Pharisees. They had the Sadducees. These members of what we call the Jewish sect. We, we talk about the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the, uh, the Zealots. He had all, they had all these groups. And this is all the believers had of the Mosaic Law being taught by these people. And Jesus called them, and I want to read this exactly, in 10, 8. He said, all who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. Now, I want to break this down. He said they were thieves and robbers. Why? Because they taught the word incorrectly. Anybody who teaches the word incorrectly under this scripture is considered a false teacher. So Jesus is saying they're thieves and robbers. What? Wait, 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 wait. These people have been teaching for years. No, they're thieves and robbers. Why is that? Because their hearts are wrong. And not only that. The, the reason we're trying to learn this morning is because you have to understand the key uh, the, the key thing that was said was what Jesus said after that. He said, all who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. Do you hear that? Who are the sheep? That's the question we normally ask ourselves. Because he's saying, even though these people are thieves and robbers, even though these people are teaching this false word of God, the people who know God will not listen to them. So he's saying, they won't listen. Why? Why won't they listen to the false teachers? Because they are false teachers. Does that still apply today? Yes, it does. What does it mean? It means that you will know somebody who is false if you are a child of God. You will know it from the inside out. When you hear it, you can be in their congregation listening with thousands of people, but you know it deep down inside when God speaks to you and says, no, that's not the true word of God. That's not how your God thinks. That's not what your God says. That's not the correct interpretation of that word. So why is that? Because they were false teachers. And so the question is, who are the, the sheep? And the sheep are the recipients of the promise. The promise we talked about a few weeks ago. What is that promise? That is a promise that, 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 that these children will be selected by God, through God, for God. And who are these children? It does, it's not based on anything else. It's based on God's divine purpose. Who is that? What does that mean? How do you know that you know God? Because you believe in him. And so the fact that you believe in him, the fact that you want to know him, the fact that you desire him is him to put place in that purpose upon you. So the recipients of the purpose are the chosen, elected children of God. The seed call. That's what we call them. Now, in John 10, 14, 
it gets more personal. If you're a child of God, you understand that this scripture gets personal because it's not really based on the false teachers. It's based on the children of God. Now, this is how we can uh, acknowledge that. It, what, the, what does it say? Uh, Jesus first says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice. No matter how many false teachers are around them, no matter how many people teach them the wrong way or try to tell them this or try to sugarcoat it and take them in the wrong direction, Jesus said, they will hear my voice. They will listen to me. Why? Because I am their teacher. He says, I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Now, Jesus gets personal with this, but the false teachers did not hear him. They didn't understand what he was saying. Why? Read verse 6. Verse 6 says this. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Why? Because he wasn't talking to them. He was talking to every one of us. He was talking to the children back then. He was talking to those who believed. He didn't care what those other people thought. Why? Because some are chosen for honor and some are chosen for dishonor. Some are chosen for God's grace, and some are chosen for his wrath. And so you have to know this because this was talked about in, in Ephesians when we talked about this. And it was talked about in Romans. It was talked about. You have to know that there was a purpose in you. Some will and some won't. You have to know that. So Jesus gets personal with the false teachers. I mean, with these people, and the false teachers didn't understand because they were false teachers. And you have to understand that it's, uh, this scripture is for believers, not non-believers. Did you know that? This scripture is not for everybody. It's only for believers in Christ. Non-believers won't hear it. Why? Because they, they do not believe in Christ. Believers will understand it. Why? Because they are drawn by the Father. It is so simple because some of us have been to people and talked to people and wonder why they didn't want it. And you're mad because they didn't accept it. You're mad because they didn't. They, they talked about your, your, your belief. They talked about the scripture. They talked about this and that. They, they put all this doubt and all this other stuff. Well, the enemy doesn't want to draw them. The enemy wants to draw you. Why? Because you are a believer in Christ. You have to know how valuable you are as a child of God. You have to know that God wants you to be saved. God wants you to know salvation. God wants you to know his grace. He wants you to know his mercy. The enemy wants everything but you to know God's grace and God's mercy. He wants you to know the conditions of your sin. He wants you to know all the things you've done wrong. He wants you to know all the negativity that's been in your life. And so let's continue on this, this, this personal letter here. Because he says, I am the good shepherd. What he's saying here is he is the son of God. He is the good son of God. He is the only son of God. And he says, I know my sheep. Now he's saying this, he's speaking in these riddles so that not everybody will hear him. Only, the only people who are going to hear him are the people who go back. The sheep of God. They are the only people who are going to understand what he's talking about. So let's change this a little bit. Let's see how personal it is. Let's read it using the words that we're talking about today, the chosen elected children of God. Can we do that? It says, I am the good son of God. Did y'all understand that? I am the good son of God. I know my chosen elected children of God. And my chosen elected children of God know me as the son of God. Do y'all understand where we're going with this right now? He says, just as the Father knows me as his son, basically, and I know the Father as my Father, and I lay down my life for the chosen, elected children of God. I have other chosen, elected children of God that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. 
they too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. And he goes further to say that the reason that the father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. Meaning he does not have to give his life, but he gives it because he wants to. Why? Because of all of us. When he died on the cross, he was thinking of each and every one of us. Don't think he wasn't thinking of you. He was. He knows you because he knew you before you were created on this earth. And so that's the most that's the most intricate detail of what we're talking about here. That means that when Jesus took a nail to his hand, guess what he was thinking about every one of us in here? You're thinking, oh, he's just thinking about the pain that he's going through. No, he's thinking about the sacrifice that he's doing for each and every one of us so that we can be here today as believers through Jesus Christ. So now that gets more personal with you because you understand that Jesus is talking about us and he's talking to us and he's talking to or from the son, from the father God himself. So the, the next thing that people always say is Paul specifically used the words purpose, used the words election. Paul specifically talked about the elect. You told me about the sheep, but you didn't say the elect. You told me about well, how, how God, Jesus was the shepherd, but you didn't say the elect. And so I'm just knocking all of this down because I know there will be people in here who the enemy bothers and said, but he didn't say the elect. He said he was going to tell us about the elect. So that's why I'm going to tell you about the elect this morning. Can I show you some more scripture? If, if you want more scripture, can you say amen this morning? Amen. Amen. I know that Paul specifically spoke of this. So the question is, where does Jesus speak of this? I want you to turn in your books to Matthew. Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Uh, Matthew 24. Jesus is speaking of the end times in Matthew 24. He's speaking of the end times uh, and to his disciples. And I want to read uh, Matthew 24, verse 21. Verse 21, he's speaking to them about the end times and how rough it'll be and how all the, all the things they will go through. And he says, for then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. So he's telling them about that. He's saying it's going to be bad. How many people know that it's bad right now? So he's saying this to them, and he's saying it's going to be bad at that time. There's going to be all kinds of things. It's going to be un, not even equal to how it used to be. And you know what he says after that? He says, if those days, verse 22, if those days had been, have not been cut short. So he's saying those times, that time will be cut short. And he gives you a reason. He said, no one would survive. And then he said, but for the sake of the amen. elect. Everybody say amen. 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 But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. What does that mean? For you. He's saying, it's going to get bad. You're not going to understand it all. There's going to be chaos. There's going to be murders. There's going to be all kind of stuff happening all over the world. Earthquakes, all kind of you know, tsunamis and everything happening. You're going to say, man, God, why are you? How many people have said that before? God, why? And he said, these days will be cut short, not for everybody in this world, but for you as the elected children of God, the chosen children of God, the chosen elected children of God. Some people say, well, where else does she say it? Well, let's go a little bit further down. Verse 24, he says, there are false messiahs and false prophets that will appear to perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Oh, that's twice he said it. Do you want three times? Because he continues to talk about you as a child of God. He says that there will be false teachers who try to lead you in the wrong way. He's talking about you. Have you seen false teachers who tried to teach you the wrong scripture, teach you the wrong things about God? Have we seen it? If you've seen it, say amen. amen. And it says, see, I have told you ahead of time. So he's telling them about what's going on in the future. So the people ask, so you ask this question, okay, he said it twice, but can we confirm that he's talking about the elected children of God? I want you to go to verse 30. They will appear, uh, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. 
Son of Man referring to Jesus, who was also God in the flesh and also uh, completely human. That's what Son of Man means. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with the power and great glory. And it says, and he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his who? Elect. Yeah. Does that confirm it with you? Yeah. He's not coming. The angels are not coming to gather everybody. They're only coming to gather who? The elected children of God. Who are the elected children of God? The ones who believed in him. Why did they believe in him? Because of him. Look. Understand this. Hear it clearly. It is not a decision that was made by you. It is not done by human hands or human effort. It is done by the grace and the glory of God. So the fact that you know Jesus, you should be screaming hallelujah because you are an elected child of God. So he said, for the sake of the chosen elected children of God, he said, deceive that, that the enemy will try, the false teachers will try to deceive the chosen elected the children of God. Who are they? They're, we are the children of promise. Why? Because God selected us. He chose us before we did anything on this earth. So Jesus, in talking in 30 and 31, he's talking about his second coming. He's talking about gathering not everybody. He's talking about gathering specific people. Who? His elected people. Who are they? According to Paul, these were selected since the beginning of time. According to Jesus, these were people that God knew before they did anything on this earth, good or bad. So the scripture connects what Paul says in his writings in Ephesians and Romans of the chosen, elected children of God. God. Chosen by him, chosen for him, before sin had ever been committed, according to his will and his purpose, for his desire, for his reasoning. You have to know that as a chosen child of God, there are expectations. God expects us to learn his word. He expects you to understand his word. He don't just expect you to go to church he doesn't expect you to go to any church because there are false teachers. He just said it. There will be false teachers at these churches. And they will look good and smell good, but the word won't sound good. And because of your insights, you'll feel it's not right. You'll hear it and say, man, we've been in church for 30 years, but never opened the Bible. We've been in church for 30 years, said all these praises and prayed to all these different people, but never said anything personally to Jesus. We've been in church all these years, but never gave honor and glory to God and, and trusted him as the creator. We thought that we made the decision instead of knowing he made the decision for us. There was something wrong when I was going to church years and years and years ago. I used to fill it in my bones and say, I'm reading something here that says predestination. Why is not anybody else saying anything about this predestination? Why are people not talking about this? The ball said it, you talk around it, but you didn't teach it. We want you to know this. God predestined you to know him. He predestined you to cry out to him. He predestined you to draw him, to, 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 to know him, to ex be excited with him. He predestined you to lift your hands and cry to him. He predestined you to be uh, uh, struck with revelation and say, oh God, you are awesome. He predestined you to be in your house or wherever you were at when you first met him and just raise your hands and thank him for all the glory and the, the goodness and all the mercy that he's had upon you. And he predestined you to finally know that it was him who drew you and not you drawing yourself. So the beautifulness in this is knowing that the chosen elected children of God were chosen by him and chosen for him. And it was before you did anything wrong. So from this day forward, don't sit there and talk about all the bad things you've done. Talk about all the good that was done through Christ Jesus. Stop talking about all the bad things because that's what condemns you. That's what makes you feel convicted. That's what makes you run back and go into those sins and run away from God. And God is saying, no, no, I did all the work. All the work was done by the Son because of the Father. 
And you have to know that. He chose you as you are. How you look, how you smell, what you prefer, how you like things. But he still chose you as you are. Why? Because he wanted to. Why? Because he can. He can do all things. He can do anything he wants. And he said, I will choose the unrighteous to be made righteous. I will choose the, the, the unworthy to be made worthy. I will choose the non-kings, the non-queens to be king of kings, to be lord of lords. You know what it says in the scripture? It says that we are to be Christ-like. That means that if he's a king, we're a king. If he, if he operates in dominion and authority, we should operate in dominion and authority. We should know that greater is he that is within us than he that is in this world. We're going to keep digging into this, this scripture, so that you can understand the depths of God's grace and his mercy that was given to his children through his son. The only way to understand it is to go over it. So that when somebody comes to you and says, oh man, I've done this, I've done that. I want to know God, I think I want to know God. Or this, that. You need to show them the truth about it. The only reason you think you want to know is because he's drawing you. John 6, 43. Nobody can come to God unless drawn by the Father. The Father, not you, not anybody else. You can't talk to the wrong person about Christ. You can't talk to the right person about the wrong thing. See, it's, it's, it's real simple. You can say everything perfect to the wrong person and they won't hear you. You can say Jesus to the right person and they'll hear you crystal clearly. Why is that? Because God draws who he wants. And it's not based on your thoughts. It's based on his thoughts. It's based on his perfect will. So stop trying to deliver people and let them be delivered through the scripture. Seacog. That's what we call us. We're chosen, elected children of God. Chosen by God, for God, through God. If you walk with that belief, then it's never about you. It's always about God. Do y'all understand that? Yes. Can you stand and give God yes. glory in the morning, this morning yes. for what he has done in your life? God glory in the house this morning.